Hello and welcome to Gameology episode 43. We're talking about the good and the bad of Super Mario Brothers 3. I'm one of your permanent co-hosts, Matthew Falva. I'm joined as always by... Attila Gabriel Branski. Mario 3. I would put it up there as one of the greatest Mario games ever made. I think it stands toe-to-toe with Super Mario World. There were so many different elements that this introduced to the Mario franchise that we see in every Mario game since then. It what My gut reaction when I think about this game and going back to it is that it's a game I can exist within. It was I think the world map had a lot to do with that. The very colorful, welcoming atmosphere. I even liked how the um, the bottom of the stage was always was just a little bit higher off of the ground. I felt for some, I like that. It just um, it made me feel like a little more cozy, a little more tucked in. The different people you meet and interact with, and the mini games. There wasn't a big hurry to get through this game, even though the princess was you know asking for your help. He just moseyed on through. What do you think? Well, I, it's funny that you say that because uh, even in the new um, Nintendo Treehouse footage, they're like, "Oh yeah, you just you just take your time with this." Like, uh, princess, she's been kidnapped before; she knows what's up. But yeah. this is the only the third t- only the third time that it had happened. Uh, but um, yeah, there's just like this game was the evolution that everyone wanted in the Mario franchise. This is the uh, progression in terms of like the way that you moved through the game. Uh, the nature of the secrets that you found within it, um, the layout, like the overworld. Oh mm. my gosh, yeah. like that's something that it became uh, core to the series and it appears in every title since then. It, it, like, I don't think you're going to find a Mario title nowadays that you don't have at least some form of ov- overworld in. Sure, I mean, Mario and 64 uh, did it slightly differently, but in a sense it was still a hub where you were going. They just, yeah. they just dressed it up in a, in a different way. Right, and like the, the fact that like not only do they introduce the overworld, but that there's secrets in the overworld, like yes. levels that you can tackle in a different order, um, things like special items you can find that you can only redeem in certain places, and some places worth it, some places not. So it was just all around, um, not just window dressing. Like a lot of mobile games nowadays will have a like overworld for all that matters. It's just one long linear winding path around right. the screen. There's no point to it, but like psychologically people like to see their little character moving along as if it was on a board game and mm-hmm. this is a game where that mattered it meant something your position in that space and how you choose to move move forward when you weren't even well you're in the game but not in the level so to speak so it was uh yeah that that's a huge addition um the ever iconic uh raccoon tail the Tanuki suit, uh, like all all those super iconic power ups in this game, uh, or at least that one. The frog suit didn't exactly see much of a return in future Mario titles. No, but the idea of taking over an enemy's personality or just taking another animal and, and sort of embracing that for like a very um, specific way. The thing with the frog suit, it was just too specific. It was amazing, and if you were underwater, but if you weren't, mm. it was very slow and. Uh, it, was, it had too much of a trade-off. You know, another aspect of the world map that was really great was the um, flipping over your menu on the bottom of the UI, and you had all these stored items. So mm-hmm. you were you were sort of storing them up for later, for, and then doing that risk reward of should I should I is this level too tough right now? Will I save the lives that I want to save for later by using up you know an important item in this bit? The princess giving you different items as you. As you complete each world that you're going to be using later on, the mini games and the toad houses were just—they were a very nice diversion and a nice break from, uh, you know, from the tense action of the the linear nature of the levels. Although the levels weren't specifically linear in a way either. I mean, even in the very first level, you learn how to now that you can grab these Koopa shells and you can kick them in different directions forward and you kick them up, and you get your first. Uh, the raccoon tail in that first level and you can fly and you find that there's all of this stuff way up above where you yeah. hadn't been able to see before whereas previous Mario's yeah you could well Mario 1 you could walk above Mario 2 was very vertical scrolling and maybe paved a lot ma- paved away for a lot of this but I think this explored even more because well these felt more like bonus areas whereas Mar- Mario 2 that was that was where the boss was a lot of the time you had to go up there and go get it yeah, there's uh, like r- there's rarely any enemies up in the sky. It's mostly just coins and clouds. And yeah, that's ones. true. Yeah, it felt like you were sort of getting away. It was another sort of break in the tension. And I think Mario 3 was a master of that 
tension and release. Maybe yeah, that's why. Was, I, uh, go ahead. Actually, they even expand on that in in World Six, where you you complete the uh, the world map as you normally would, and then you get transported off to sort of another spot, and it sort of mimics that going up top I- in a way. I think it's called Skyland too, as well. So mm-hmm. it's you know very fitting for that. Yeah, no, it's um, like the the progression through the different worlds is like what helps to sort of tr- like train you up through the game. Um, Again, I was a kid who f- found out about the warp whistles and then mastered getting those, went straight to World 8, and then I was doomed because oh, yeah. I didn't learn how to play the game properly, so I could never beat Bowser. Yeah, and this I is could never get to Bowser. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah, because it's, I mean, World 8 is, is definitely a huge step up from this more easygoing nature of a lot of the worlds. And also, sort of the point of going through all the levels at a time is the incredible amount of lives that you accumulate as you go through yeah. because this added this expanded on uh, Mario 1 and Mario 2's end of level by having a question box and mm-hmm. you uh, if you ran at a certain speed or if you hit it at a certain angle you could time whether you're going to get a mushroom or a flower or a star if you got three random ones you got just a I think it was maybe a basic three up but if you could get all three of those stars all three of those flowers you get a lot of uh, a lot of extra lives so by the if you went through the game honestly without using any warp whistles by the time you did get to world Eight, you would probably have dozens and dozens of lives which you would need because world Eight got very very difficult very very fast it but in a way that felt intuitive especially if we look at the airships at the end of each level they it's all just the same platforming and the same techniques but they have a lot more bottomless pits and just they're throwing a lot more at you so intuitively with the actual platforming and what you're doing they've told a story by making it an airship and and giving it that epic feel and i think that's just a beautiful way of sort of tying a narrative into just really increasing a platforming challenge yeah i think it was a nice sort of break that people are used to castles in the first game uh as the final areas and then now they introduce these like big floating things in the sky and the entire ship is like moving up and down and it, it mm-hmm. feels different from the rest of the game because you don't have control over the camera anymore you're just trying to survive as you're being bombarded from all sides like as you said it really sort of ties in like a narrative feeling into the like this is a final zone this is a real test of your strength and your abilities yeah and the uh and what they did with the sound chip too to make that sort of like timpani it sounds like there's an actually an orchestra playing with the the way that timpani kind of goes boom 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 just i mean the music is what's that everyone knows it so well oh yeah and the music is i mean is so amazing like it's been in in every mario game but um um actually and and if you fail to complete that airship the first time it'll now move across the map so if there were any of those levels that you maybe have skipped before now you're gonna have to you know, face those, and so it's a great way of sort of bringing up everything you've done along the way, and uh, and then seeing, sort of punishing you in a way, and incorporating the levels that way. It's uh, but like in a really interesting and different way. Like, who saw that coming? It's like you, again, castles rooted to the ground, very solid, and then you fail at the thing you're expecting. Okay, I'm going to see the game over screen, then I'm going to get to try playing again. What? Where's it going? What? Yeah. It, it must have been such a mind blow for people to see that the very first time just like their objective is relocated to somewhere else in the world yeah and it, it gave that world more of an organic feel and the world map had a lot of moving objects on it whether it was just dancing trees yeah the world maps were uh were very specific too from like a grassland to a total desert world and that they use that visual nature in all of the levels a lot of times with the enemies with the music and it just it gave it it made you feel like you were living in these tiny little worlds where they didn't have a lot to work with but what what they did left such a mark and you know a lot of the enemies that were introduced into this game became a huge part of the canon booze that uh you know that will only progress if you are if you're not looking at them um the chain chomps what are they called thwomps those big guys that come down hard that's right and uh and of course, the little boot that Mario jumps into. Yeah, Karibo's shoe. And sort of, um, if you think of the character of these different levels, like there's a certain level that has an angry sun that comes to mm. life, or there's certain levels that have a gigantic fish that's sort of stalking you, almost like the movie yeah. Jaws, where it's one gulp and you're done. One of the levels going up and it's going down into the water. There were so, I mean, it's just so chock full of these moments that you remember, but 
are not just gimmicky moments. They work directly with the game mechanics and they just make it a little tougher, but then introduce something that makes it feel like there's a story going on and, and character being developed. Not developed, but the levels have character is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it makes every level feel like a unique experience. It makes you feel like um, it helps to break up the... Like I, I wouldn't even call it monotony because it's all just really solid platforming, but giving the player just these little uh, tiny like tweaks on the formula they're expecting, it just makes it feel like something unique or different is happening. It uh, adds to that bit of excitement. It keeps you coming back and saying, like, well, what's the next level got in store for me? Yeah, absolutely. Um, especially when you first progress to that next world and you see that it is so different, and then you know that from now on almost anything is really possible uh the two players switched from the competitive aspect of mario one to the cooperative aspect where if one person completes a level it remains completed so you you're working together you're fighting over mushroom houses you're uh, fighting over who has to do the more difficult levels and it almost can become you know a point of pride as to who is clearing the most levels and, and clearing the bosses and getting you know getting the rewards from that it's interesting. Before we started this video, we were you were saying you thought we'd have a lot more to talk about with this game, and there is a lot to. But I almost feel like because it's such, such a no-brainer that it is so great, I feel like I almost have less to say about it than say Mario Two, where I was searching for what is this game all about. Whereas in Mario Three, every, so much of it is so it's like it's always been there. But to try to put yourself in that mindset of what it would what it would have been like compared to every other game out there it's just it was just worlds apart it felt like nintendo had access to different tools than the other developers had it felt like they just had this understanding and they could go they just had a whole other toolkit they could use i mean it's definitely the the feeling you get when you see like a movie that you really liked you're like wow that was great and you, when you see a movie you really don't like it you've got hours and hours of conversation material picking it apart um but let's let's go through it shall we let's sure. look at um First of all, you've got the uh, different movement mechanics in this game. You have the uh, the little P meter at the bottom of the screen that builds up. Like it was always a component of your game uh, that, like in the previous Mario title, uh, Mario One at least, when you, your character you would hold down the run button and you start picking up speed. That meant you could jump further. But now they've extended it so that uh, first of all you have a representation of like you're seeing your character reach their max speed, and now you know that when you reach that highest possible speed, and it's not even um, that you have to like go consistently forward, like you can do an about face and still preserve that maximum speed, yeah. like still keep building that P meter, and then you can jump crazy high. And sometimes that was useful to um, just bypass certain parts of the level that you found particularly difficult. Um, most famously, it meant that when you had the Tanuki suit, you could just straight up fly like right over mm -hmm. everything. You know, and, and um, a quick uh, a quick note about yeah. that is that it's visually placed in a way that when Mario's running to the right, by the time you hit the P speed, it'll be the camera is now lined up that it's Dead almost center. right below him. Yeah. And if you don't feel like looking at that, it has that audio cue as well of the whistling yeah. sound, so that you know when you're able to jump. Yeah, and he also extends his arms out so that you just they right. they really didn't want you to miss out on the fact that like hey. Something special is going to happen if you jump now. You're going to go way higher than you might have expected. And uh, I don't think anyone ever complained about the fact like, whoa, I jumped so much higher than I ever expected. So, yeah, just using those three different cues to signify to the player that you have built up enough speed, something special is about to happen. Um, they really telegraphed that well and made it an important component to the gameplay. Um, but, yeah, the, the Tanuki suit, being able to... Um, like fly in midair uh, that's crazy like hit, hitting the button to just like jump higher and higher and higher mm -hmm. was such a, a novel experience it almost made um, like completely bypass some of the platforming challenges in the game because now if there's something that's too difficult for you you can just fly right over it or you can um, but but they were like, still able to gate it because they knew you had to yeah. have a certain amount of speed to pick that up. And like you said, you uh, could use you the about the... face to try to to try to build up some of the momentum. Uh, most notably in the first the first castle where you go yeah. up to get that warpless, so you need to use that skill. But it's not oh, they can I got good at that. Yeah, but they they uh, they can still put it in a way where you're not going to be able to fly out of a certain situation. Yeah, so it was definitely something that didn't. Um, 
It didn't completely circumnavigate the challenges, but it, it let you use it in interesting places. And there were those power-ups, those special power-ups you get from Peach that gave you unlimited P meter, and then you could just fly forever. So mm -hmm. that um, that definitely let you just bypass, like, oh, this level's too tough. I'm just going to fly right over it. Uh, it's just something you see in Super Mario World as well with the wing cape or the feather cape. Right, and the cape, the cape introduced something really neat with the um, if you could time time it, and then you could just sort of float forever where you lost the ability yeah. to fly. But yeah. I mean, that's but for we'll talk more discussion. about that when we inevitably yeah. discuss Super Mario World. Mm -hmm. I'm looking but, forward uh, to comparing the two because when I think yeah, there's uh, it's it's one of those things where like from Mario one to Mario three, we see so many changes. Uh, and we definitely see several more changes from Mario 3 to Mario World, but I think that uh, like Mario 3 set the bar for what the franchise was going to be, and then Super Mario World was like an evolution on top of that, bringing things over onto the Super Nintendo, mm -hmm. but not in as much as... Um, like They didn't uh, which, go back to the drawing board, and there which, wasn't as which many Which is amazing changes. that... That they had a, a brand new console to work with, and yeah, it looked a lot better and it sounded a lot better. But to if you look at these two games back to back, Mario Three and Mario One, and realize they were made on the same hardware, the incredible yeah. amount of detail. Right now in the video, it's uh, in a fortress, and just the tiny, the way they make those blocks, um, sort of those gray bricks that make up the most of the background in the fortress levels, is astounding. The like the little white detail that goes around the edges and um, yeah. Just, tiny little pinpricks of white it uh, there's so much depth and so much life on these tiny little pixels it's it's a master class in how to do pixel art absolutely and that's like that's something that i i reference um well done pixel art and games all the time if i'm doing my own artwork i can look at some um, like how did they choose to do uh this decoration how do they do this um th this uh, smear frame in animation do you know what that is no Okay, a smear frame is any time where you have um, s like a, a really exaggerated motion where you take a character and you actually like stretch them out. Uh, and if you tried to pause it and look exactly at that one single frame, it would look really odd. Mm -hmm. But seeing it in the context, like if you're animating at like 12 or 24 frames per second and you need a character to move really quickly from one end of the screen to the other or you need their punch to like fly from... Um, you know, one side of the screen to connect with the villain's face on the other side of the screen, you have to have this frame in between where, like, their arm is stretched across the entire screen because okay. you don't want to have... You don't want to have their hand and their fist in one position in one frame and then connecting with the villain's face in the next frame. You want to have this, like, motion blur effect where their arm is, like, stretching... Uh, beyond the normal physical constraints. So I don't think they employed any of that kind of smear frame stuff in... Um, this Mario, but I know they use it in uh, other Mario titles and really just tons of games in general. Any animation techniques, um, you can really gain a lot by looking at the uh, the artwork in these games. Hmm. You know, uh, a great mechanic they introduced here was getting more height off of jumping on an enemy. And mm -hmm. by simply not having to time the button press again when you land on them, but just simply holding it. And it made it... And then offering you the reward if you've jumped enough times and you're going to get a free life out of the deal. Which they did the same in, in Mario 1 as well, but they made it a lot easier, a lot more accessible yeah. in this one. Hmm. Mario, what else to talk about with this game? Well, the, the carrying mechanic, right? So they had, yep. the, uh, they had the ability to like pick things up and lift them over your head in the previous game, but now they sort of refine that. So just as long as you're holding the sprint button down, right. Mario will just automatically grab something in front of him and then he'll kick it. As you say, you can kick it forward, you can kick it up, you can kick it in all the different directions. Um, and that, that made it so that if you needed to like reposition a Koopa shell so that it was somewhere else, uh, Sometimes they made it part of the challenge of like you have to jump on a Koopa, grab its shell, and take it somewhere else, and you can send it going, and it um, hits a bunch of coin blocks for you. Mm -hmm. So that was um, a vital part of like improving the Mario formula that we saw returning in Mario World. Yeah, there's definitely uh, one of the underground levels, I th maybe in like World Two or Three, where you absolutely need to master that mechanic or you're never going to get out of this level. And they introduced a few of these sort of puzzle-type levels, and I felt like the fortresses 
represented what the ghost houses became in the later levels where there was they were straightforward to begin with but then they started um introducing a mechanic like the level with a million doors and you just have to trial by error find these different doors and then try to count them and and so you can land in that special spot and it wasn't just a you weren't just trying to find the right door so you can get out of the level but you could um find you know different rewards and different spots maybe get a power up maybe get some more lives and it's they sort of slowed things down which is really interesting that they kept the time limit in the game because it is a game if you listen to the, th the theme of the game is very very slow it's got that more of a reggae bouncy feel for the main uh the main theme of the game which lends itself to more exploration but they still kept that time limit. they didn't want you messing around too much in in the levels they wanted to keep that challenge up which i always thought was i don't know maybe a way to um safeguard if you had found yourself in the wrong spot um you know maybe you would ended up in in a part of a level where you couldn't get out i don't know if there are any moments in this game that have these sort of dead ends but perhaps maybe someone is lost they they're banging their head against the wall there's no enemies there to kill them and the timer is there just to just a safeguard in case something like that did happen i don't think i don't think that can happen necessarily but you know having that um like if you have an unlimited number of tries at something because there's no time limit, that can detract from the the challenge of a level. Mm -hmm. But when you impose a time limit on a level, it means that uh, basically if you want to explore it to its fullest, you have to come back to it. You have to play it a second time. So I think that might have been more the motivation that like if you wanted to fully explore every single level, you'd have to come back to do it a second time. You couldn't just completely clear it out your first time through yeah yeah that's just my guess yeah uh, and it adds a bit of urgency um also actually you know what i think they might have put this in is because it's it uh is often played as a two-player game so right it's tied to your high score how quickly you can clear the level that's that's true as well but also say if, say your kids and your sibling is playing this you, there might be some fights where you know you're like mom he's not finishing the level he's just staying in the level I, mm. it's not my turn until he dies or he beats it but I, you know, that's something a, a sibling might do. Like, oh, don't mind me. I'm just going to jump up and down until you go crazy. Mm, I can definitely see that happening. Yeah, it's just so, a, it's just yeah. a way to. I mean, they they did that in Super Mario 3D World as well, where you might have four people, but because there's that time limit, you're sort of gently persuading people that we need to move on forward and like stop exploring. We all have some place to go. We need to get to this flagpole at the end. Hmm. So, what else? What else? Uh, See, that's what I'm saying. It feels like there is so much to talk about, but in a way, it's the game is so. Maybe it's just because we take it so for granted that it's like. I mean, the underwater. I think they improved greatly, the the swimming levels because yeah. they gave you a lot more room to breathe underwater, and uh, I feel like you never really got into those same sort of jams you did in Super Mario Brothers One, where you might end up in a spot and that squid just does not leave you alone, and you're you're up against an object you can't get around. Where I felt yeah. like this one expanded a lot more, gave you a lot more vertical room to explore, and um, I felt more empowered in the underwater levels in this game. Right. Like, I think that's it's one of those um, sort of instances where you mentioned near the top of the episode that the frog suit is, like, really uh, underpowered uh, when you're on land. That's definitely true. But wouldn't it have just been great if, like, any time you're in the water, you have, like, frog suit-style movement? Would that have been so terrible to give the player that level of control all the time? Well, it, it's definitely faster. So if you found the water levels, or Mario's swimming too slow. I, I don't think his, you know, it's not like Mario 64 where his swimming is very slow and very boring, especially considered to what you can do out of the water. Mm. Um, but I feel like you can get going pretty fast in this one. Uh, and, I mean, the challenge of it is trying to balance him and, and uh, because it, it's so different from his normal walking mechanics. So... I, you know, I'm pretty fine with it as is. If they had introduced the frog suit every time, I don't know if that would really make sense. Unless Not that he's constantly wearing the frog suit. It just give him the mobility that the frog suit would afford naturally, but have, it, have that be the baseline. Sure. And then you could maybe have a, a few more enemies because he has such a, a better ability to dodge and move around um, with that. Yeah, you probably could have done that. I think that is... Like, water levels and ice levels are, uh, are very common tropes, especially in this era of gaming mm -hmm. and I, I always felt like ice levels 
were not that fun. I mean, they just made things sort of yeah, needlessly no. difficult, and it made sense. Okay, we're going to increase the thing you you have grown to learn and master the whole way, but I never particularly enjoyed them. It just felt very frustrating. Um, I didn't really like an ice level until I think it was Super Mario Galaxy, where you spin and then you have mm -hmm. now you now you're using the ice to your advantage. You're going a lot faster, yeah. and as long as you can avoid banging into an object, a hard object you're actually you enjoying your speed and motion yeah so it's i think slowing people down and that's what water does is probably not the best way to go you want to keep that joy of movement yeah so um yeah because normally they when they with the um ice levels they want to have like the increased like slippery surfaces and ultimately ultimately it just means that you end up like landing on a platform and then sliding off to your doom because you you landed too close to the edge um it's one of those things where uh, I think ultimately what we can sort of take away from these kinds of things is that, you know, does having the ice levels in the game make it better or worse? Like, did they achieve more by having them in there than it detracted from the overall experience because it was, like, not as much fun? What do you think? I, I think the strength, I think it is good to have it in there, and the reason that it works is that the eight worlds in Mario were so different from each other mm -hmm. so that you and you know going into it that as soon as I get through this this it's not going to be like this anymore and the same way that world seven can be a little bit frustrating because it really slows the pace down and you're spending a lot of time on platforms that you're waiting for um, sometimes them to replenish these movable platforms sorry that you control and you jump in the way the direction you're pushing when you land on it you can change the way it goes so in the way that that was a slower challenge and not necessarily as fun and rewarding as the rest of the game at least it was only there for that one period of time and they switched it up within the world and the same way world six does it you know that it's not going to last forever and it was just sort of a like i said with mario three that it does so well is that it has that tension the tension of the ice world then it releases into something completely different so yeah. i i think it uh, it added a bit of variety to a game and they always included a warp whistle so if you didn't want to do that ice world no problem you can just flute right on by yeah and i think that's uh it, it's interesting in a game where like they, they clearly wanted to make the experience like as long as possible that they did give you these abilities to just skip so far ahead into the game mm -hmm. um like for because the game did feature a save system right like you could save no. you didn't have to no okay the okay see i only played it on game boy advance oh okay so that that's why i could always just warp right ahead to world eight and then uh, okay then it all kind of clicks into place never mind mm. yeah and that was a limitation that they were dealing with i mean they had had they had safe functions in other games that came up before this zelda right yeah zelda and uh, and you had a password system of metroid but oh. but they didn't want to yeah who wants to write down those passwords and then you write down a circle instead of or not a circle you write down an o, o instead of a zero. zero yeah and then you're screwed gotta put a line through it yeah um but it's uh i i love that they have the flutes because you it means you can approach this game and you could beat it in one session if you just wanted to you know have a racing its time or just have a quick little jaunt or you wanted to access those levels without having to uh without having to you know go through all the muck but if there was one thing you could could put in to improve this game i think it would have been a save system i wonder why they didn't put it in maybe it was a, i wouldn't be surprised if it was some That's kind of limitation at the time sorry. but i mean there were rpgs other than zelda too the like final fantasy games were using save data but maybe they just wanted to keep it simple. It's Mario and keep it more of a challenge for people to go through. But it was definitely, I mean, um, you know, a great addition that came into Super Mario World. Right. And I figured just that um, given that it was something that they added in when they remade it for the Game Boy Advance, I feel like it's something that they really would have liked to have in the game from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, people regard... Um, Mario Brothers 3 is like the perfect game um, but ultimately I think what makes it such a perfect game is that no matter what your preference is like there's the the ice world levels which you don't exactly like but they're great because they're add a little variety and there's you know 
the the fact that there wasn't a save system in it, but then they added in later. Like there's little nitpicks you might have about the game, but there's just so much there to appreciate and enjoy. Um, so many secrets to discover, so many things that just like to fully explore that game would take so much longer than just the sort of core completion time. Mm-hmm. Um, just like all all the different like varieties of uh, platform experiences created by the difference in like the level design between each world, uh, the, like the the regional enemies, like everything about it just made every level such a novel experience that everyone found something to love about it, and people really do love Mario Brothers three with good reason. Mm-hmm. So. Well, now I'm looking forward to talking about Super Mario World whenever we eventually get to that and comparing these two and coming up with which one I would take to my uh, take to my desert island. I mean, Super Mario World has more content, but there's just something about the beautiful package that Super Mario 3 cuts that I just love. I feel like Mario World I always lose steam on, but Mario 3, maybe because it lacks that save feature, you got to see it to the end, so I have more connection. I was also younger when I played Mario 3 when I was... So I, I can kind of answer that question now because I have actually beaten Super Mario World. Okay, okay. So what what anyway. what was your answer there? Is that oh my answer is Super Mario World because I've actually been able to get through to the end of that game. Ah, all right, all right. That sounds like it's about it, right? Yep. Fantastic. You can find my stuff on a nineteskid.com. There's video versions of these episodes on YouTube, audio versions anywhere you download your podcasts, and at Attila's site Blue Screen Productions. You can tweet at me at Game Think Talk. And hey, if you use the special form Attila has, you can ask questions or just say comments if you're really smart and you don't need questions answered, and we'll read good ones out on the show. You can be famous. What do you say, Attila? Yeah, you can find all that on my website, as well as links to some of the games that I've made. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Bluish Green Pro, or visit my... You already said that. Yeah. I usually say that. You well, said we're trying to time. switch it up so that people don't <laughs> get bored of the outro. Yeah, and there's also my personal profile on Twitter you can follow me at, which is Attila Gabriel. It's, so very, it's a very on. personal profile. Thanks, everybody. No. Share it with somebody who might like it. No, it's not personal. It's totally robotic. It's like Zarnak Fortress out there. No, that's the other one. That's the difference. If I tweet something personal, it's the personal profile. If I tweet something about a game, it's Blue Screen Pro. That's why I have two. Nothing gets past Attila. That's why we have him on the show. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye for now. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.